session will be available. Uh, if there's any offers, uh, it will not be uh, into the terms and conditions that we make the offer for. So again, True Tech Tools sponsoring this session. Here are some of the brands we cover with from either HVAC or home performance industry. And some of the product categories we uh, seeing ones in airflow measurement and test and balance, as well as uh, safety and uh, OSHA administration. There's some new things going on there. We'll have some follow up webinars on that shortly. And then a new area we're building. If you're not familiar with the GoToMeeting system, go to webinar system. Uh, you'll see an orange uh, arrow on the side of your screen when you're logged into the console. If you, push, if you click on that arrow, it'll pop out a box, and then you'll see a little tab um, beneath which you can hit the plus minus sign, and you can actually type your question in, and it will come to one of our staff members, and we'll be answering it in the background. Eric Preston is joining me here today, along with the presenter, Ed Mattos, of course, um, but we'll try to keep, uh, keep up with the question stream and either answer them directly or uh, post the, um, the results uh, private, privately or publicly. Depending. With regards to DPICUs, if you're interested in that for what uh, we're doing here today, um, you have to answer for each session. You must watch the session live. In other words, if you're watching the video, we can get DPICU credit. Uh, list goals uh, is great. And the attentiveness value, which is something DPI considers when determining CUs. Uh, TrueTech will upload an attendee report, which is automatically generated by the system, so it's sort of like hands-off. We just send them the report from the system within 72 hours to the DPICU portal. Uh, if you correctly entered your CEU number, um, it will be within the trouble after that. Please contact us and we'll, we'll check into it for you. So here's a quick slide on Ed. Uh, Ed's president and under competitive advantage consulting. Uh, he's sales management experience and he was vice president of sales for a nationally recognized financial home performance. So that's really extracting that experience over in how 2.7 to 8.6 million in sales uh, to, to talk about that sort of the process, the journey he's been through, and I, he'd like to share with you how we can help your home performance business build in that way. So we'll be doing some polls. We're going to run these polls here quickly, sort of to get to know you and see who's who's out there in the audience. So let's uh, get the poll started. First poll is, what kind of work do you do? So if you could please answer that. Uh, when we get a substantial number of people answering the poll, we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Again, so you can kind of see who's involved in this call. Okay, that's a good representative number. We'll close the poll, share these results. You can see that 56% of the people on the call today are here or in the home performance uh, industry. And we're just going to take a real quick check and see what's your role in the organization. If you could please uh, answer that question. Just click on a click on an answer there. Multiple answers aren't allowed, so you really got to figure out what you do. And that's a good representative number right there. So I'll share those results, and we can see that 35% uh, are owners, followed by an even split between other and technical contractor. And let's just get another quick idea about the area of the country that you're working in, because so many aspects about home performance do vary based upon segment of the country. We also kind of want to see what our reach is and our coverage in terms of running these sessions. Okay, that's a great representative number. Thank you for your vote. You can see that uh, we're split um, evenly between the south and the west, 29% each, which is different than the first time we ran the session. I believe it was mostly northeast the first time we ran the session. So thank you for your uh, contribution there. And one more quick poll. Do you have written sales procedures or processes or conducted training in that way? 
and we're running up here. Very good representation, very fast voting. Thank you for doing that so quickly. No, pretty resoundingly no. I think that's probably why you're here today. So let's uh, move on with things, and I'm going to turn the session back over to Ed. You can go ahead now, Ed. All right, great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, can you guys hear me all right here and see my screen? Eric? Looks good here. Looks good here. Okay, great, great. Yep, you're set. So, what was that? Yeah, you're set. Okay, great. So, just want to thank everyone for listening in today. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and I know we're all busy in this industry, a lot of moving parts, so I really do appreciate it. And uh, my intention is that you'll find this session useful uh, and really have some strategies that you can take away and, and, and um, put to use uh, in, your, in, in, in your business. I want to thank True Tech Tools. I want to thank BPI. Um, really, really great for them uh, allowing CEU for a sales-focused training. And so to kind of start the session, you can see this uh, first screen right here. It says, sales management, effectively train and develop your salespeople. And that's really what I'm focusing in on today is really the process of sales management. Uh, Bill said a little bit about me, just to tell you a little more. You know, I've really been on both sides, especially in this industry. I started in, in, in sales myself. Um, I, first, first couple of years in the industry, I sold about uh, four million in home performance and HVAC in right around two years, a little over two years. So, you guys know, with an average job size of maybe around you know twelve thousand, I've been in a lot of homes. So, I've been in hundreds of homes. I was fortunate enough to you know move on to a sales manager, then a VP of sales roles, and really train others. And you know, I really truly believe in sales as an art and a true profession. And what I really want to speak to today is carrying that over to sales management. You know, if I believe in sales as an art, I also believe in sales management as an art as, and a skill of its own. And I think too often in people put in the roles of sales managers and, and, and owners, we don't really have a training platform for that. There's actually a great book uh, that I utilize and was able to, to learn a lot from. It's called The Accidental Sales Manager. And that's by Chris Lytle, and I'll reference him again later. But he's one of my favorite sales trainers and educators, and that that kind of is what happens a lot of times in, in 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 our industry. Either you're an owner and you're growing, or you're the sales guy, and then as you're growing, you're kind of thrown into this sales management role without any real training to go along with it. And so that's kind of the idea of the accidental sales manager. So I spent a lot of time developing resources and really trying to hone in on this craft of sales management and that is my goal is to transfer some of those some of those skills and strategies to you and techniques so I'm going to speak really to this aspect I'll cross a little bit there's a couple sales people on the line I'll cross a little bit into that aspect as well but this is really focused on sales management so to get started first and foremost Right. First and foremost, this is kind of my thesis, which is sales training is as important and needs the same amount of, of time and attention from the beginning as technician, auditing, or construction training. Right. So, you know, we have to understand as 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 business owners and as contractors, every time we hire somebody, that's an expensive endeavor. Right, uh, I'm sure people listening know exactly what I'm talking about. You put effort into into the hiring process, uh, a lot of time and attention, and that's a really an invest investment in that individual. So it's costly for a company. So you know the last thing you want to do in sales is just kind of throw people out there and and see. Well, we'll just see if they you know work out. And then unfortunately, that's what happens a lot uh, with in-home sales. You know, you really want to use the process from the beginning with the same amount of time and attention as you do with the technician auditing or construction training. You know, I in my line of business now in sales consulting, uh, I'm working with with home performance contractors, and and the way I start the process is I get out there and I get in the field with their sales uh, sales men or women, and I see what they're doing and and kind of try to dig into their language and see what their level is at. And one of the first companies I worked with. 
I went out with two guys, and you know they both were great auditors. They they really knew how to run the audit. They really knew their building science. Uh, they were they were great people, and and they were nice in front of the homeowners and all these things. Uh, but they really did not know the first thing about true professional in-home sales, and they were really kind of fighting an uphill battle from the beginning with the language they were using and and how they were approaching it. And so I asked both of them. I said, so what was your training process? Uh, when you when you came in and they both said well we just kinda went out and shadowed the other three guys and watched each of them do it three or four times and then they showed me how to do the paperwork and then they just let me go so uh, unfortunately that's what we see a lot of in in-home sales is people just kinda say well why don't you just go watch them and then go do it and, and really what I want to challenge you to do is think about this uh, this process as the opposite of that right so that's kind of what I'm going to be laying out for you today is a really comprehensive sales training process. Now as I speak through this, you'll see me kind of talking about this from the beginning, like somebody coming into your company that you've hired and, and laying out what that would look like. But I do want to stress that there's always time to retrain. And I want you to think about that as we go through. Obviously, uh, as owners and managers, you have people already out there selling, but you can always revert back. You can always employ these tactics and these techniques to retrain them and help them learn and get better so this doesn't have to be uh, oh well shoot they're already out there challenge yourself to get back out there and, and really and really help them out and remember that salespeople want want training and they want to learn so when we look at an onboarding process right I really say that that needs to be a comprehensive and diverse onboarding training process and you really need to take your time there's kind of this thing in in-home sales, and I, I really didn't make this up. Uh, this, this comes from elsewhere, but it really takes one to two months to start being good at something, and that's really to just start being good at it and, and kind of grasp it. And it really takes about six months to hit your stride as a professional salesperson. So think about that. That's a, that's a good amount of time. And, and what you want to remember is you want to treat everyone the same regardless of their experience, and you really want to make sure that they're selling your services how you want them to. You know that they're not bringing bad habits with them and ultimately you can ensure that they are trained in the way that you want them to operate. So I had a guy um, you know in my kind of second year of, uh, of, of, of managing who I hired and he'd been in sales actually for 25 years, he's about 20 years my senior, um, comes across as really um, you know, really refined and a professional, and so I kind of made the mistake early on in, in, in my training days of, of just kind of getting him going and um, kind of you know, abbreviating my sales process, giving him a two to three week training process and letting him go, and as I started to see the results, uh, he really wasn't doing well, and I was, I, I was kind of shocked, and so I got back out there when, in the field with him, and I was really able to see that just because he knew sales and, and he came across so great what he didn't really know was in-home sales and he didn't know in-home sales the way that we really wanted him to and that learning curve took a lot longer and I really dug back in with him and it wasn't until about six to seven or eight months later that he really started to hit his stride and then it, at that point I tracked a year from there and in his first really full year after I thought I had spent the proper time with him and he'd gotten the proper training he closed 1.8 million in home performance and HVAC sales. So that's the difference it can make regardless of experience. So there's kind of this old adage that everything's been done before, right? And you can learn from those before you. And I'm a big believer in that. So one of my kind of favorite trainers of all time and someone I think we can learn a lot from is this guy right here. So I hope by now some of you are recognizing uh, this is the great Mr. Miyagi, and uh, he is someone who is all about process. And if you look at his training process, the way he sticks to his training process, how he employs it, and you kind of pick it apart, we can really learn something from him with regards to any training, and especially sales training. So I'll expand on that a little more. But when I look at my sales process, I really tried to think about as I, as, as I got more experience and I started to have more success and, you know, our, 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 our numbers got bigger, I said, you know, what would kind of be my mantra if I were to break down my core mantra with regards to, with, 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 
with regards to my sales process. And so when I did that, I came up with this. And this is really my core, at the core of everything and how I operate and trying to train people. And that's creativity, oversight, repetition, education. So I'm going to expand on, on, on these and, and kind of try to come back to them throughout this process that I lay out for you. But really, when I think about it philosophically, this is at the core of a great training process. So when we talk about creativity, and you really want to mix things up, we have to realize as, as owners and managers that people learn in different ways. Some are more visual, some are more analytical, some are more experiential, right? So you really want to have a diverse and engaging training process. And, and that first few weeks is where you can really kind of set the tone for that. And you can really let people know that you're in this to create a, a creative process and something that's going to keep them engaged. Sales training does not need to be boring. It shouldn't be boring and you're really in control of that process. So you can see that evident here of how Mr. Miyagi is mi mixing that up and he's just having fun fishing at the same time. So I'll go into this a little bit more when I talk about the four must-haves of a training process. Oversight. You, know, you really need to oversee the process and you need to oversee their progression. Are they retaining the information the way you want them to? Are they using the right language? Are they presenting things the way you want them to? Uh, you know, responsibility and accountability are also huge for salespeople. So your oversight is critical in kind of setting that tone and bringing an environment of responsibility and accountability that is going to serve you well when you get a year down the road or two years down the road and being able to have that relationship. So one of the things I like to say is I don't like this to be like a heavy-handed approach. Like, you know, it's my way or the highway. But oversight should really be working together. You know, you're really a team, and that's kind of why I'm showing here Mr. Miyagi, really showing him the forms and, and overseeing that and working together with him. So that's the idea there. So repetition. I think you, if you've seen the movie, which I'm assuming most of you have, or the movies, uh, you know, you, you understand this, paint the fence. The other repetition is, is the other kind of even maybe more famous is wax on, wax off, right? So what we need to understand is that people learn through repetition and over time. Nothing happens overnight. If you teach and preach repetition and practice, then this is what they will do. And that makes a huge difference in their learning process. So education. We really need to understand as, as managers and owners that our employees are looking to us for guidance. You know, they want to learn. So I like to say that in home performance, professional in-home selling of home performance should be a consultative, education-based approach, and as should your sales training approach. So what we do in the homes should mimic how we train our employees. This was a great scene in the movie, by the way. <laughs> so how do we do this, right? How do we kind of have this core, you know, mantra, creativity, oversight, repetition, education. I like to utilize what we call, what I call, the four must-haves. So my four must-haves that are integral to any sales training process and professional in-home selling are readings, scripts, shadowing, and coaching. So I'm going to kind of dive into each of these so we can better understand them. But one thing I would really like to stress is the, the critical component of the entire process is language. And you can see this slide here. It's very straightforward. Language, 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 right? The idea is, is that language is everything. And... In, in sales as an art form, sales as a profession, the linguistics of selling is incredibly important of how we communicate with clients. And you found this image here, it's kind of interesting, it's almost like the interconnectedness of language, right, and how interconnected that really is. But you need to focus in on language with your employees, especially in the home performance industry where, uh, where there's, there's so many kind of 
uh, terms and, and, and there's so many things that go into how we talk to people. Language is incredibly important. You know, are they using the right language that's consistent with company messaging? The right language to set themselves up for success with homeowners. You know, that's really on you to determine how they talk to clients. Uh, so one example, uh, I'm going to actually give two examples, two examples of, of, of kind of breaking down language, you know, uh, with regards to our industry um, and, and kind of try to give you guys something to take with you and something you can employ in the field right away is um, when it comes to home performance, there's, there's two words that I really do not like and we really should not ever be using um, and those are report and recommendation. So it's easy to use the word report because when we do a you know when we do an energy audit it, you know it actually comes up with a lot of times the software we're using is called a comprehensive you know home report or your energy report but report is not the word you want to be using with clients that you're just going to give them a report at the end of the process that you're going to give them a report to you know look at so just think about what the word report actually connotes I mean, what is a report well, a report is actually something that you are supposed to look over, read, and think about. So if you tell people you're just going to give them a report, they're most likely going to say, okay, well, let me look over, read it, and think about it, which is the opposite of what you want them to do. Recommendations, think about what the word recommendations connotes, right? If you, if you rec a recommendation is something that you should that ultimately triggers in someone's brain, okay, he's recommending something, well then I should think about it, I should weigh the positives, positives and negatives and feel whether or not I should act on that recommendation. But the, 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 the connotation of recommendation is again something you think about and kind of weigh the positives and negatives of. So instead of saying people you're going to give them a report or recommendations, what you should be saying is, so at the end of the process here today, I'm going to provide you with a whole home solution to make your home more comfortable and energy efficient. So I'll say that again. I'm going to provide you with a whole home solution to make your home more comfortable and energy efficient. So the key there is the whole home solution. So now you're providing somebody with a solution to their needs. When you talk in terms of providing people with solution to their needs, it's much more powerful. So an example for HVAC, so we had a few HVAC people on the line. Uh, you know, people in HVAC, they're generally calling and, and they feel they want a quote or an estimate, right? And that's, you know, calling the company, I'd like an estimate, I'd like a quote on something. And HVACs a lot of times is, 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 is a little more tough because you're walking in the door and they are getting a lot of quotes and estimates and you kind of have to compete with that. So my advice is to take the conversation away from quotes and estimates and, and really if you come in the door saying, okay, well, I'll give you a quote, I'll give you an estimate, then that's what they're going to start thinking about is quotes and prices, estimates, you know, kind of fall into the same bucket as everybody else. So why not walk in the door and say, okay, great, well, I'm going to take a, take a look at your system here and, and uh, you know, kind of get all the details. And at the end of this process, I'm going to provide you with the best solution for your home. So my goal is to really provide you with the best solution for you and your family and for your home. So again, very simple, but providing you with the best solution. If you take the focus off of price with your language, the less they will focus on it, right? So these are just a couple examples of language and underscoring the importance of language. You know, really, when I when I dive into this, these are probably two examples of I don't know, maybe a hundred or two hundred that I can think of. And one of the things that I do when I work with companies to come in and and really assist in overhauling their sales process and increasing numbers and close ratios, this is what I'll help to do is is really break down and, and switch the language and make sure that we're communicating with people in a way that's most advantageous for us. All right, great. So let's get back to the four must-haves. So readings. Readings is the first of the four must-haves. And this really brings in the education aspect to that process. So kind of bringing it back to the core mantra, right, education. And you can also be creative with your readings. So one of the things with readings is, is you really want to make it interactive and you can find ways to hold your salespeople responsible in that process and really helps them think more critically about what they're doing and how they're learning. So one of the things I like to say is you can do is you can just start with your company website. You can say, all right, what I want you to do 
uh, tonight and we'll meet again tomorrow at 2 o'clock is, is I want you to go through our website and just read everything on our website, every page, you know, every sentence. And, and I want you to hone in and pay attention to the language. I want you to just write down, you know, 10 things that, you know, you like or stand out to you or, or, or questions or pieces of language that really resonate with you. And we'll go over that tomorrow. So by giving them that assignment and, and, and focusing in on language, it'll be very interesting for you to see what does stand out and that'll provide for a great uh, starting point for your training. So I have a couple, couple uh, resources that I really like. Residential Energy um, happens to be one of my favorites. I really liked giving people the intro to Residential Energy. And the intro to Residential Energy is pretty interesting kind of provides a whole, you know, intellectual oversight of, of the industry at large and then really gets people thinking. So I would say as an assignment in the first week, I would give them that chapter and I'd say, I want you to just read this and, you know, highlight five pieces of language you like or that stand out to you and we'll go over them when we meet, you know, Thursday at 9. And then guess what? Thursday at 9, the first thing we're doing is going over that. So again, this also gives you the ability to bring in some of this responsibility and accountability. If you're giving people this assignment in the first week and they're not following through and they haven't done it when you meet Thursday at 9, probably not a great sign. Uh, you know, one thing I'd also like to stress is, is these are great exercises ongoing. So if you're a manager or an owner out there right now and you're holding sales meetings, which I, which I hope you are, at least on a bi-weekly or monthly basis, you know, bring this to the table right now and, and, and say, hey, I've found this great industry article and it's really interesting and, and I got a lot from it. I want you guys to all read this, you know, jot down five things that you really like about this or pieces of language that stand out to you and we'll discuss this in our next meeting. So scripts. Scripts are incredibly important to utilize to support your sales process. And remember, scripts are not meant to make people robots. Rather, they're there to give them the tools to practice and to hone in on the proper language and approach for their craft. So one of the things I like to really hone in on and that's, you know, that's easy is the introduction. You're kind of at the door introduction. You're kind of at the door introduction, right? So what are they saying when they get to the door? How are they making the best impression? How are they opening the sale correctly? So Again, this is something if I'm coming into a company, I'm going to start developing all these scripts and, and really honing in on this process. But you as an owner, you could do this tonight. You could say, hey, you know what? And I saw a lot of people on the line say they don't really have things written down. Well, you can start that process. Go home tonight and say, what do I say when I get to the door? I know what I say really works. Write down that whole thing. That's a great exercise for you. What's your kind of company elevator pitch and your company mission? Is that worked into your introduction? Write down that whole introduction, refine it, and then take that to your employees and say, hey, this is the best way I think of, you know, kind of opening the sale and approaching clients. And when you give people these scripts as tools, you can role play, you can encourage them to practice on their own. This goes back to repetition. And we have to remember, just like any sport or anything, sales is no different. That practice really does make perfect. So shadowing. Shadowing is incredibly important and I'm a very firm believer that you have to have your salespeople shadow you first. So you really need to provide the groundwork and kind of show them how it's done, so to speak, right? You know, if, if some of you as owners weren't necessarily the salesperson, um, and, and, and that's not your forte, then you could have them shadow your most successful, you know, representative. Uh, but I really like to say have them shadow you first. If you're going to have them shadow your representatives, which I also think is good as part of the process, only have the, only leave that to like one or two people. You know, you really don't want to have them shadowing four or five, five people. It starts to, to, to really kind of create confusion in their mind. There's too much going on. You want to keep it focused. Say, hey, these are my two best. I really know they're operating in the way I want them to, so have them shadow them. Make sure when they go out, they're really just listening. They're there just to listen, kind of keep their mouth shut, take notes, and then you can speak with them about that process after. And then it's very important once they get going for you to shadow them. And as a manager and owner, 
we often uh, fall victim to losing touch with the field, right? We start just sitting back and we think people are, 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 are out there doing, you know, their audits and they're out there doing their closes and we just ask them how it went and we just look at the numbers um, and we kind of take word for how things are going. You know, it's really up to you. Get back out there, especially in the beginning. Shadowing people is incredibly important so you can provide that coaching. And, and coaching is really the natural transition from shadowing. And ultimately, as a sales manager, that never stops, right? So as a coach, you want to provide constructive feedback, positive reinforcement, recognition, you know, when they're doing well, motivation. And these things are incredibly, you know, and these things are incredibly important. We really cannot forget that. You know, in sales, and in, in sales, it's you, sometimes when when people get going, they feel like they're out there on their own, and and you really want to understand that a, a, a coach is important. Um, there's one of my favorite little sales lines is 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 in in home sales, you got to be upbeat, not beat up. So remember that, and remember that you as the coach can provide that platform for them to continue to be upbeat. It's really easy if you have a few no's in the road to get demotivated, or a couple clients that really you know, maybe weren't great quality, and the great thing about sales is that next opportunity is always another opportunity. So be there for them to help with that motivation. So those are really kind of the four must-haves that I would say for your sales training process. And I kind of want to give an example with regards to our industry and really with regards to home performance. Uh, so. This has to do with teaching with selling with the infrared camera. I think this is incredibly important for our industry. This is one of the best tools we have to create a visual and emotional connection with our customers and with our clients. So if you're not using infrared, infrared camera, I would you know, strongly suggest that. Um, but you want to really make sure that your salespeople, they know how to leverage it and use it as a selling tool, right? Not just that they know how to actually point it themselves, but how to use it as a selling tool. You know, this is really what differentiates us as an industry. So I really want to make sure we're always doing an IR walkthrough with the client. You know, when I get out there and I'm and I'm, I'm training and 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 uh, diving in with um, with salespeople and and they do an infrared walkthrough and they don't involve the client, I get really upset. This is your opportunity to really do something special that they're going to remember and create that connection. So teaching selling with the infrared camera, right? There's really a strategy behind that. So I always say you want to do that in conduct in in conjunction with the blower door. Right? That's when you're going to going to get that most powerful reading. It really looks techy and interesting and it allows for people to really understand that we're here doing something different and leverage that as as a value add. So make it make it interactive. Start you know with your hand on the wall. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in the next slide. Find good spots in the attic. You know missing insulation, high hats, high hats, and top plates. So you want to put that blower door on, on, walk around for a minute or two, find some good spots, then grab your customer, then do a nice thorough walkthrough that you can leverage to your benefit. As you're doing this, you want to dumb down the language, right? And you want to reinforce the benefits of our work for them. Kind of the classic, you know, whiff them in sales. If you don't know what that means, that's what's in it for them. You always want to be talking about things in terms of what's in it for them. And I love, you know, as you're kind of getting towards the end of your walkthrough, letting the customer hold it and walk around with it. And then they really see that it's real. You know, oh wow, this isn't the guy's not just, you know, messing with this. I can do it too. And and this is something that people really remember. They'll be telling their telling their friends about, and 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 this is going to help you get referrals. It all really plays into the process. So teach selling with the infrared camera. If you can see down here on the right, you have this this uh, hand, and I always think this is a great way to start. That makes it interactive. As you turn on the camera, you know, explain what it is and how this you know really reads temperature differences and allows us to further identify weak areas in your home where we're losing energy. And let me just show you how sensitive this is. Point it at the wall, put your hand on the wall, take your hand away. If you haven't done this, it's really cool. Your hand imprint just stays there. And that always kind of breaks the ice. People are like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. Wow, that's, that's, that's crazy. So it's a great way to make it interactive and really start that process. And then, like shown in some of these other pictures, you really want to make sure you're finding good places to, to highlight to use this to your advantage. So. 
I put a little I put a little example of a script. So if I'm talking about scripts, here's an here's an example of how I would lay out a script for teaching selling with the uh, infrared camera. So also I want to stress um, here that at the end of the process here today, I'm actually going to send you guys um, these four slides on teaching selling with the infrared camera. Uh, I really want uh, people on this call to to have things that they can take away and again use in the field. So I'm going to actually email you these these four slides and you could practice this with your with your salespeople and say, hey, let's let's you know let's get this into action. So an example here in talking about teaching with the infrared camera, I'll just kind of read this to you as how I would do with 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 somebody I'm training. I would say, so you're pointing it, you're pointing it, and you're showing the customer and say, all right. So the way this works is the yellows are the higher end of the temperature and the blues are the colder. So here, if you look at this, we're pointing it at your attic, and you can see where it's bright yellow. There's really just no insulation there, and the heat is just coming right in the house. So that's actually the reverse in the winter, and those are cold spots where the heat is just coming right out of the house. That's exactly why we want to get in the attic, properly seal and insulate so we can keep all that heat in your home in the winter and out in the summer. And in doing this, you'll actually be more comfortable while using less energy. Does that make sense? So that's an example of a script that does that make sense at the end is, is there for a reason you're getting agreement from the client you want to be getting agreement as much as you can throughout your process as a salesperson so what I want to stress is that sales training is really an ongoing process right don't just let them go you have to really stay close by and you kinda of have to remember I love this shot here you, this is how this is how most inexperienced salespeople feel, how Daniel Sun feels in this picture. And uh, you know, but once once you feel they're ready to go, let them let them go at it themselves. But really be close by. And I like to I like to really help our salespeople in our industry prepare at the beginning. Prepare them for the close and then say, hey, I'll be there, you know, I'll I'll be available during your first close, your first couple closes. If you really need to call me, let's and let's let's talk after. Right after meetings with clients is the best time to talk it through and coach. You know, while that experience and those people are fresh in their mind. So I would always love to speak after the first few closing situations, whether it's a yes or a no or a maybe. Doesn't matter. You want to ask them, how did they feel? You know, what went right? What didn't go as well? How comfortable are you starting to feel with the language and with the process? This is when you can provide so many valuable lessons. Another way to really create that oversight and, and kind of stay close by is, as a manager, I would say, I want you to invite me to every closing on your calendar, every solution review on your calendar. So now you know when these are happening and, and you can give encouragement before and after. Maybe you surprise them with a call two weeks later, say, hey, I know you're headed to Mr. and Mrs. Smith's house. Let's just have fun, enjoy yourself, do a great job. Hey, give me a call after. You know, this really to the business. And that's something you want salespeople to always remember. Anytime you're going in a house, that's the most important thing. So ongoing process. You gotta get back out there with them. Right? That's that's really important. You have to see how they're doing. And this is the only way you can truly know if they're operating as you want them to. And moreover, how to help. So again, with coaching, you want to provide praise, encouragement for what they're doing well, constructive feedback for what they're not. You know, and this is really critical. And, and I also want to, I want to um, point out here, even if people are doing great, you still want to get back out there with them. You know, four weeks later, or three weeks later, or five weeks later, that is going to help you. So you want to go out and you want to see why they're doing so well. You know, what did they take to, you know, what stuck with them? And when you go out and see your top performers that you've trained, why they're performing well, this will help you effectively train the next person. So I mentioned before one of my favorite sales trainers and educators, and his name is Chris Lytle. 
and he has two books that I really love, Accidental Salesperson and Accidental Sales Manager, uh, and they're, they're both great, but one of these quotes I really wanted to just put in the forefront of our mind, and sales is a profession, right? It says, professionalism connotes the idea of continual education and improvement. If you have the desire to learn and to hone your skills, you can strive to be a sales professional. So one of the things I take very seriously is in-home sales in our industry as a true profession. And it's important. It can be a great career. And one of the big injustices I think we can do is not provide people with the proper training and not provide people with the proper support in sales to the point where they get frustrated, they're having mediocre results, or even worse, they quit. So we have to, as managers and owners, we have to take the responsibility that sales as a profession is truly meaningful and we have to provide the platform for this training and this learning and make it ongoing. All right, great. So after they've kind of got going, this comes, now comes the importance of pipeline management. All right, we've kind of all heard this word before and it's kind of one of these words that I think just gets thrown around too much. Like, oh, are you managing your pipeline? Or, oh, how's your pipeline? You working your pipeline? Well, what does that look like? You know, how, how should we be approaching that? And that's very important. I mean, you cannot ever think that you can just go about in-home sales and meeting to meeting without following up with people, without really working your pipeline, without getting back in front of people Working your pipeline is incredibly important, and moreover, it's up to the manager to set the tone for that. So what you want to do is you want to really have a platform where you're setting a one-on-one -on -one pipeline meeting, and that's a weekly meeting. I like to do weekly for one hour. You could do every two weeks, um, but these meetings are great because it really allows you to dig into each client. Um, first, what I would do in these meetings is provide a little session just to talk, you know, and just to kind of, you know, we get so busy in home performance. Again, there's so many moving parts, but provide a little time to sit down with your salespeople and just talk at first. You know, how are things going? How are they feeling about things? Let them express themselves. You know, maybe you vent and share some stories about some, you know, crappy or crazy clients or, you know, share some stories about some great clients. Share some stories about some great relationships you're building and some of the great people you're meeting. Now, that's one of the things we always have to remember, and I always stress to people in sales, like, hey, you have the opportunity to be out there and build relationships with people and meet great people on a daily basis. You know, how cool is that? And when you think about your job from that, that standpoint, that you're being with people in a way that's, meaning, that's meaningful and, and impacts their lives, because we know the work we do impacts their lives, you're going to act more powerfully as a person, and you're going to be more excited to be out there. And we always have to remember, if we're not excited, why the heck should they be excited? So again, don't take their word for it. One-on-ones really help them, you know, close more deals. It helps them, uh, you know, it helps act as a as a second check. If you're a salesperson on this line, I would say go ask for these meetings. Go ask your sales manager. Say, hey, you know, I really would like some some uh, some help managing my pipeline. And in those, it's great to go through every single client and say, you know, what happened with this one? Oh, I forgot about them. You know, I meant to. You know, I left a message. I just haven't heard from them. And, what was the last, you know, what was the next step? You know, well, they said they were going to town. Well, let's give them a call. Let's email them. Dig into each client. It's going to help you close more deals. So a little bit to help with pipeline management. Again, what does that look like? I would say, first of all, you want to set out at least two to four hours every single week, depending on how what your volume is, where you're literally sitting down and just doing pipeline management, either at the office or at home. You're sitting down for an hour, you're calling people, you're emailing people. You really do need to have a place, a customer relations management, a CRM, or somewhere where you're managing your clients where you can open up and see your active clients. And when you have this active clients list, it's very important that this list is around 20 to 25 people you know, at all times. You don't want a huge list of, of active clients. It's better to just move some people to kind of you know, what we call dead clients. All right, these people are done and get them off your list. It's in in home sales. If you have too long of a list, it leads to inaction. So you really want to be able to open this list, have 20 to 25 people that's rotating that you can call, 
you know, email. I like to, when I call, I like to leave powerful messages that stress the benefits of what's in it for them, remind them, hey, this is going to save you, you know, $1,200 a year. We're definitely going to be able to, you know, to, to make your, your son's bedroom warm. I know this is going to make a huge difference for you with you. Just give me a call back. I'm really looking to, you know, really looking forward to speak again. Uh, send powerful emails. You know, we have to leverage email in our day and age. So email and then call again. Hey, did you get my email? And I even put on here drive by. Sounds kind of funny, but I've actually driven in my in my if I think back in my I sold about two million in my second full year, and I had at least I I closed three deals by just driving back by the client's home. And you do that strategically. You're in the area, you see where your audit is, and, and you see where you're, you, how you're at, and you say, okay, I haven't talked to them in a while. I've built a great relationship with them. This doesn't make sense. Stop by, knock on the door. Then they answer the door. Hey, how you doing? I was just in the area doing another energy assessment. I just wanted to, you know, I haven't been able to get in touch with you. You'll be so surprised by some people's reactions. They start apologizing to you. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We meant to get back to you. We've just been so busy with the kid and the graduation and the grandma. And then all of a sudden, no, don't worry about it. I totally understand. All of a sudden, you're talking, and all of a sudden, you're setting up another, um, you know, visit to come back and go over things with them again. And all of a sudden, a week later, you're closing that deal. So I literally closed three more deals for about a total of forty thousand in, in in one year by just doing this drive-by tactic. So pipeline management is incredible, in, in, in incredibly important. So setting goals, right? You know, once people are up and going, you have to set goals. It's really, really critical that you set goals. Uh, one of these great quotes here from Yogi Bear, you know, if you don't know where you are going, you'll end up someplace else. Just great yogiisms. And I have this little one here of the chalkboard, you know, it's kind of writing it down. That reminded me of just something very simple. You know, when we were kids, we were taught to set goals. And, and it's no different now, and especially in sales. You have to set goals. And I, when I think about goals, I like to say set small goals at first. And really, as a manager, focus on their performance, not their results. This allows you to really hone in on how they're operating and kind of takes the pressure off. I used to like to say to some of my some of my salespeople on their first couple on their first couple calls and first couple closing, I'd say, "Listen, I don't care if you close this deal or not. I really don't. All I really care about is if you feel good about what you're doing, and if you feel you're performing well. If people are performing well. They're following the process, using the right language, feeling comfortable, building relationships. The closes will come." So as you're starting to set goals, it's really important to dig into some of the data and track, dig into some of the data and track close ratios for people. And when you're when you're when you're tracking close ratios, this allows you to get more information and not focus just on volume. Oh, they did 80,000 last month. Oh, this month there was 70. Well, this month there was 60. This month there was 90. Well, what are some of the data that can points that can help you understand how this works? So close ratio. I like to track first job, first visit jobs one. So if you have a a model where you're able to try and close the deal on the on the on the first visit with the homeowner, then you should track how many times that's happening and how many of those are then closing on the second visit. Is the number a lot higher? Maybe you want to move to only second visit model. Maybe not. But these are two data points that you really want to see. Maybe you want to work harder on your first visit uh, process and make that more effective if that's how you're going to be setting up and you realize, wow, we're only closing like one out of 20 people on the first go, but we're closing, you know, 10, 10 out of 30 on the second, that's a big difference. So another interesting one that I want to get out here is called a close held ratio. So if you think about a model, and I think this is probably most models in our industry, is you're going to home, you're running the energy assessment, and then you're setting up a visit to come back to go over their solution and that's what I call this closing right that's when you're really trying to close the deal so we started tracking a close held ratio meaning what percentage of the people were holding that next sit down what percentage of those people were you actually getting back to to even be able to present because a lot of people fall off in the in the interim and one of my guys that that, that I had uh, his numbers just didn't seem to be 
you know, weren't weren't adding up. And I I knew he was he was good, and and he had been trained right, and he was he was really doing well with customers. But when we were tracking this close held ratio, what we found is my top performer at that point was getting back to 87% of the people that he set up a closing with. The other guy was only getting back in front of 65% of the people. So really what was happening is he was having a problem holding that closing. So what we focused in on was firming up appointments, setting appointments the proper way, setting the right expectations for when you come back to the next visit, and we actually worked on that part of his sales process and sure enough when he got back up to over 80 percent close held ratio his numbers increased with that so this really helps you identify identify areas that could be possible problems so once people get going I like to say use the first month as a barometer for moving forward right and then start increasing the goals uh, based on their success and based on other success. You know, if you close 60,000 one month, say, hey, you know, we have enough volume. Why not 85 next month? You know, why not 110 once you hit 85? You know, let's let's look at averaging 110 over the first quarter. Let's set a quarterly goal. And you really want to let them know what's possible and and start to really hit those bigger numbers. So. I'd like to say in these last two slides here, back to Mr. Miyagi and his process, you know, as, as sales managers and owners, we need to really invest in our employees' success and we need to really master the art of sales training. And invest in your ability to become a successful sales manager because that does take effort. And that's one of the things I think is very important is that you need to work at becoming a successful sales manager. Don't just hire people that you think are good. Make sure that you control them um, working out. Uh, you know, one thing here with, with this concept of retraining people, I just want to share a little success story. One of the companies I'm working with, uh, I went in and they've got uh, five sales guys and um, they had, you know, a decent amount of volume, but, in, you know, in the month of May, they closed. I, I came in at the beginning of May, in the month of May, they closed, I think it was, look at the numbers here nine deals and I came in and, and instilled this whole process of, of digging in four must-haves scripts approach coaching shadowing everything we're in the what third week of June and they've already closed 15 deals so this really works as managers and owners out there on the line double back time and effort it will pay off and the last thing here I'm going to leave you with is this quote from Mr. Miyagi. I think you can all read that one. Definitely one of my favorites. But you have to have the mentality that you are responsible for their success, nobody else. That's one of the toughest things for people to really grasp as a manager that you're responsible for their success, you're accountable to their results, but you're doing that together as a team. All right, that's it from my end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. Um, we've been answering a couple questions here as we've gone along, and I'm not seeing uh, any more questions. If anyone wants to use the question panel, please feel free to do so. Okay, you still have some time to do that. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, just run a couple of quick slides um, to, to close out here. And take over. Okay. So we didn't mention this before because of our audio difficulties, but we are running a special promotion from TrueTech for anyone attending this webinar. We're going to give you 10% uh, off our already discounted site prices uh, through 6:30. So that's just uh, it's another eight days. You really get a chance to take uh, take um, advantage of this. The code you'd use at checkout is HP Matos. So that's Home Performance Matos. Maybe that's Ed's new nickname. I don't know. Um, and it's 10% off site prices. You can't use it with any other promos. It means it's not stackable and it does expire at midnight Eastern on the 30th of June. 
Next week, uh, Ed and I will be uh, together at Habitat X, which is a, a really great uh, session that's out in Montana. It's organized and run by Chris Dorsey. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot of things, really about the, kind of the future and practice of the home performance industry, meeting with a lot of other people. And uh, it's a very unique event. It's a combination think tank presentation, uh, conference seminar. It's, it's really hard to describe, but it's something very interesting. Um, you can still sign up if you'd like to. It's habitatx.org, uh, I believe. And I'll actually check on that in a moment to make sure I'm doing that correctly, make sure I'm doing that justice. True Tech Tools does have many resources available on our site. And this uh, webinar will be one of the resources that will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, but you can also find many of our videos um, in the video library, as well as technical training books, guides down there, soft download software at truetechtools.com forward slash resources. And here's way too many links to stay connected with True Tech. Probably the best way is to, uh, to sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can either drop us an email, we can uh, get you signed up, or you can go to a link to do that. But we do have uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, uh, even some Pinterest we're doing, and we have a blog at the truetechguy.com. And let's see, uh, got a couple of questions here. Um, Ed, have you heard of Sandler sales training in any of your dealings? This comes from Ken. Uh, Sandler, is that what you said? Yeah, S-A-N-D-L-E-R, sales training. Uh, I have not. I have not. But I will write that down and check it out. Okay. Sandler sales training. Was there an addendum to that? Similar? No, similar? there was just a, a question from Ken. Okay. And I'm going to do one quick thing here is make sure I give you the right address for Habitat X. Um, sorry for my misspellings here. And it's habitatx.com. That's the location you find it uh, if you're interested in that. Even if you're just curious about it, uh, there's some publications and journals. Uh, True Tech Tools is one of the sponsors, along with Retrotech, Knopf Insulation, Home Energy Magazine, and Panasonic. Respond for all sponsors of this uh, great event, which is actually happening next week, and um, Ed will be out there too. Yeah, I would, I would, I would second that. Definitely, if you haven't heard of Habitat X, go online and, and check them out, and you know, on their website and read about it a little bit. They have some great resources. They have a webinar series as well, and. The conference itself, I'm um, really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be pretty amazing and really developing, you know, strategic initiatives for our industry at large. So, uh, yeah, and you could still sign up very, very soon from now, within a week, but why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, very good. Uh, well, we've finished up here. I don't see any more questions coming in. And we're just going to end the session. Again, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel in about a day once we process the video. So if anyone wants to go back and review it, of course, the um, there will not be uh, PPI credits available for you if you were just viewing the video. But otherwise, um, you could just take a look at any of this uh, for follow anytime you want to. And Ed will be uh, sending out, we'll send uh, contact info of the people who attended out to Ed, and he'll be doing some follow-up with you also. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, look forward. Uh, if you get our emails, we'll be sending out another list of some new webinars we'll be doing over the course of the next couple months that will be coming up shortly. Thanks again for attending, everyone. Thanks, everyone.